Today we are going to delve into a very interesting subject. What is the soul and how can we best understand the soul and what it entails? Now, over the years through my global travels, I've come across a whole range of descriptions and interpretations of the soul, ranging from simple to very complex. I've heard some say that the soul is the spirit that makes us who we are. Some say we are alive because we have a soul. Some believe that the soul has supernatural powers. Others think that it is a bright light that jumps from one body to another, from lifetime to lifetime. Some primitive schools of thought even say that we are different from animals because we have a soul and they don't. Now, it's a bizarre statement, isn't it? But many do actually believe in that. Um, so there's a whole variety of, of understandings out there. Many cultures praise good souls and they condemn bad souls. They also fear souls, the bad ones belonging to the devil and the good ones to God. And they practice some of the most complex of rituals to remain safe from the bad souls. There are a large segment of people who just don't know. They just don't know what the soul really is. Apart from what their parents and grandparents and teachers have told them, which they admit they don't understand. And then there's an equally large number of people that don't believe in the concept of the soul, period. They believe we live in this world via statistical incidences and coincidences, and then one day, the light goes out, and that's it. There's nothing ahead. We're simply over, switched off. So you can see how complex this subject can get, from inspiring to scary to bizarre. And the difficult part is that people tend to have deeply rooted beliefs, and they can be easily offended if these beliefs are challenged in an inappropriate manner. So let us start today with the premise that everyone's beliefs are fully respected, whatever they are. Now, with that being clear, let us explore what is the closest approximation to what we can best understand and accept where the soul is concerned. Hopefully, today we can try to derive a more logical understanding of life and the soul in a manner where the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle can begin to fit together. So let us start with what the published literature definition is of the soul. The first one says, the soul is a part of humans that is regarded as non-material and immortal. It is separable from the body at death. It is capable of moral judgment and susceptible to happiness or misery in a future state. It remains part of a human when disembodied after death. So that's the first definition. The second definition says that the soul is the principle of life, feeling, thought, and actions in humans. It is regarded as a distinct entity separate from the body and commonly believed to be separable in existence from the body. It is the spiritual part of humans as distinct from the physical part. That's the second definition. Then there's the third definition, which is simpler, which says the soul is the spiritual part of a person believed to give life to the body and in many religions thought to live forever. So here we can see multiple definitions and roles of the soul. In the published literature, the soul is generally considered a separate entity to the body and one that is subject to a reward or punishment at a future stage after death. I like the third definition from the above because it is simple and it says the soul gives life to the body and lives forever. Very nice and simple. 
Now let us build upon everything we have heard and read about the soul through our lives and develop a framework that we can find understandable and one that fits with our own sense of logic. So therefore today, to help us, our wise angel friends Cyrus and Luminous are going to join us and share their thoughts and insights and wisdom on the subject. So we welcome them. And Cyrus starts by saying, before we go into the concept of life and soul, I would like to share with you a fundamental aspect of your world, which may appear in the form of a riddle. This riddle, which is sacred, will accompany you every moment of your lives. And when you reach crossroads, remember what it says. The origin or creator describes life in this material world through the following message, Cyrus says. He says, your world is based on two simple premises. What you think is, is not. And what you think is not, is. I will repeat. What you think is, is not. And what you think is not, is. This is the sacred riddle. Cyrus says, reflect carefully on these words as you journey through this world, where the real exists hidden amidst endless illusions. Therefore, what you see, what you hear, is so unreliable in this world of illusions that what you think is, is not, and what you think is not, is. And he says, you must strive to discover what is real, despite the veils of all the illusions you will encounter every moment. Cyrus continues, he says, now what Luminous and I plan to share with you today does offer some useful answers to this riddle that you can use in your daily lives. Thank you for sharing this precious gem of wisdom, I said. Towards the end of today's discussion, we will come back to the sacred riddle and look at it with a renewed understanding that Luminous and you are going to share with us. So we thank you for that. Cyrus replies, you're most welcome. He says, you have invited us today to join you to offer some insights on the soul with respect to life on this earth and beyond. Luminous and I are assuming that you are all familiar with the different scriptures and that you do believe in their teachings. And if you don't believe in their teachings or you at least try to consider them and draw the best you can from them. So we're assuming that that's where we all are starting from. So we will start with the simple but profound statement that appears in multiple scriptures, which says, and I paraphrase, we have created you all from one soul. We have created you all from one soul. And this phrase appears in several scriptures, according to Cyrus. And so Cyrus says, I would ask the question, if you are created from one soul, how can you be all different souls? You know, if you're created from one soul, how can you all be different souls? You can see where the logic begins to falter here, he says. You are either all one soul, or you are 8.1 billion distinct human souls journeying through this earth. Then next add all the rest of creation sharing this earth with you, and that would add up to trillions and trillions of souls. So let us choose one unified line of thinking. Lumina added, I would suggest we start by accepting the premise that you are all one soul. And that this one soul is of infinite intelligence. It is an ever living and an eternal source of life energy, which indeed is what our creator is. So it is an ever living and an eternal source of life energy, which is what our creator is. So you are all one soul he says, which embodies the characteristics of the creator. 
Cyrus said, assuming you can accept this premise as a starting point, then we can begin to explore the next profound statements in the scriptures. And there's one which that says, and I will paraphrase, he says, the creator is one, which means he is pure unity and oneness. And this is the one soul we are talking about, unity and oneness. The next verse says, he is absolute and the origin of everything. Absolute is like the number zero, and all numbers emanate from zero. If there's no zero, numbers cannot exist. So the creator is the absolute foundation of everything, which makes him the origin of everything. This, once again, Cyrus says, is the one soul we are talking about. The foundation and origin of everything. Next, the scripture says, he was not created, nor does he procreate, which makes him non-divisible, i.e. absolute unity. It also makes the creator ever continuous, because he has no beginning and no end. That which was never created and does not procreate has no beginning and no end, which means he is ever continuous. This indeed is the one soul that you all are, Cyrus says. Absolute unity and ever continuous with no beginning and no end, which makes you all eternal beings. And the final verse says he is beyond all comparison or imagination, which means the creator is absolutely unique. The one soul is absolutely unique. There's nothing comparable to him. And so once again, this is the one soul. And all creation as you know it, draws life from this one soul. Your imagination as humans is so limited that what it would be impossible for you to compare or even start to imagine the, anything with the creator who is absolutely unique as the one soul. So he's beyond all imagination. These words of the scriptures help establish a better understanding of the one soul. Luminous adds, the one soul is where you all draw life energy and intelligence to experience life in this world. This is why life is so precious to every creation. Every creation fights for its life to the very end. He adds, to take this logic further, if you are one soul that is ever living and eternal, it makes each one of you an eternal being. And hence you do not die when you drop your physical form. And based on this logic, it becomes evident that the one soul is in fact the life of each one of you, the life of each one of you. And we are going to call this the life level, Luminous says. Cyrus interjects and asks, Okay, that's fine, but then what is it then that makes each one of you so different? What is it that gives each one of you a distinct individual identity? So I decide to answer Cyrus's question. I say, it is our consciousness. We are all one soul, and each one of us is an individual consciousness that embodies intelligence, thought, and the capacity to experience life. Exactly, Cyrus says, your consciousness is living, he says, because it draws life from the one soul. So at your core, you all are one. And this supports the words of the scriptures, which say, and I paraphrase, Cyrus says, you're all one humanity. And when you kill one being, it is as if you kill the whole humanity because at the core, you are all one soul. And this is where your ethics of living come from. Ethics that you put into practice via your individual consciousness, a consciousness that is imperfect and evolving with each experience you derive. 
This is what makes you humans imperfect, Cyrus says, because you have a consciousness that is evolving and developing based on the experiences you derive in your life journey here. This is remarkable, I said. And it brings us to the cycle of life, not as souls, but as individual consciousnesses. And the cycle of life is, and we've heard it before, the origin is light, light brings life, life brings experience, experience brings knowledge, and knowledge is light. Now, if we look at this cycle through the eyes of our consciousness, what does it say? Luminous responds, it says that the origin, which is the source of your consciousness, is light, the one soul. Light brings life to your consciousness, which is also from the one soul. And this life enables your consciousness to gain experience in your journey. Here, as beings of intelligence, endowed with the capacity to draw upon all the teachings you are presented with, experience life, and process your experiences, and learn from them to gain knowledge. And this knowledge is light, because you all start life with an incomplete and imperfect consciousness. So if you go back to the analogy of the sun and its rays, the sun is the one soul. And your consciousness is the ray, which is not as bright as the source, because it is imperfect and evolving. As the consciousness derives knowledge from its experience, it gains light. And hence it grows brighter and brighter until it reaches a stage where the consciousness is as bright as the one soul, its source. And then it becomes the one soul. It becomes what we call the universal consciousness. So Cyrus adds, so if you consider yourselves as individual consciousnesses, then life in this world makes more sense. You are here, endowed with life, through which you are able to gain experience, which becomes knowledge, and this knowledge perfects your consciousness until it reaches the ultimate level of light, which is equivalent to the one soul. And at this point, the consciousness becomes the one soul and its universal consciousness. At this point, all individuality is gone. So Cyrus says, now let me add another dimension here for you to think about. Cyrus says, just as the consciousness can evolve upwards into the one soul, it can also evolve downwards based on your ethics, thoughts, and actions. And many scriptures, he says, talk about the dissolution of the individual soul, which we now know as the consciousness. Some scriptures express this dissolution in harsh and severe language, making references such as being burned in a place called hell. Reaching this state, according to some scriptures, comes from a total breakdown of your ethics, morals, thoughts, and actions. I suggested, I said to Cyrus, we've all heard of heaven and hell, punishment and reward, but don't these notions represent the time when these scriptures were first revealed to an audience that was intellectually less developed? I can see why the reward and punishment argument was presented, to represent beacons and outcomes of one's ethics and way of life, because this was the language that people of the time could understand, bearing in mind they lived in ways we would call barbaric today. When I wrote the book Involved, I was inspired with a first-hand view of life in a little town called Sarfa in the Arabian Peninsula in the year 600 AD. This is before the coming of Islam. And as I wrote what I witnessed, I was shocked by the pure darkness and barbarism of people at that time who lived in the absence of all ethics. Then, through the eyes of a 13-year-old courtesan called Amira, I journeyed through Abyssinia, where Christianity was practiced as a way of life, and then to the desert enclaves of the Jews 
who practice Judaism and its esoteric dimensions. And then back to Serfa, where the religion of Islam by this time had begun to spread across the Arabian Peninsula. I witnessed the massive human transformation that comes about when ethics taught by scriptures find their way into the human consciousness. It transforms them from barbarians to civilized societies. So I can fully understand why such strong language appears in the scriptures, because softer or more pleasant language would have absolutely no impact on them. For those of you who haven't read In Walk, do try to. Take the time. It's a, it's a really fun book, and it's available on Amazon, so you can, you can have it delivered to your home. And its message is both materially and spiritually transformational. But it's also quite revealing when it comes to human thoughts and actions, when ethics are either absent or being totally disregarded. So coming back to the scriptures, today, we are intellectually far more evolved than the people of Sarfa were. And we can see beyond the reward and punishment argument, and we can recognize the impact of our thoughts and actions on our consciousness. Feed the consciousness with knowledge and light, and it reaches the highest level, which is becoming the one soul, the universal consciousness. Go the other way, and you reach this point or state of dissolution. So I asked Cyrus, what is this state of dissolution or point of dissolution that the scriptures talk about? After all, like you said, we are here to learn and grow, and we draw upon all our beautiful, all-nurturing, ever-living life level to achieve this growth. And from what I understand, we are all given opportunity upon opportunity to correct ourselves so as to keep growing and progressing. So why the dissolution? At what stage does dissolution happen? Cyrus smiled and replied, I see that you don't like the idea of a dissolution. So let me help you understand the concept better. He says, when you look at it from the eyes of your consciousness, those of you that keep spiraling downwards through your thoughts and actions, sliding from deterioration upon deterioration, you reach a point where your consciousness is no longer able to draw life energy from the one soul. It can no longer manifest again. This is how we interpret the stage of dissolution, which is Cyrus and Luminous. This is how they interpret it. On the other end of the spectrum, there is enlightenment of the consciousness. So, one end of the spectrum is enlightenment of the consciousness, and at the other end, there is dissolution of the consciousness, which occurs when the consciousness becomes so dark that it is no longer sustainable. It has to be turned off, and this is the one way to view dissolution. So how is it turned off, I ask Cyrus? He replies, it is turned off by losing access to the light and life energy from the one soul. That's what happens. He said, now I presented dissolution to you all in gentler language, because the idea is not to instill fear in anybody, because it's not about the fear. It is about your growth and progress, and it is about understanding why scriptures say the things they do. And he says, I believe that it is not difficult for you all to see that the pendulum can swing both ways. It can't only swing one way. It swings both ways from enlightenment to total darkness. The scriptures use heaven and hell with harsh references towards hell for an audience that was not capable of understanding the concept of this pendulum. In the end, the message is still the same. Each extreme of the pendulum has an opposite outcome, absolute light, and total darkness. So I asked Cyrus, so what happens when a consciousness undergoes dissolution and can no longer have access to life energy? Does it simply cease to exist? He replied, sadly so. And that is how we interpret dissolution. And this brings me to another question, I said. According to your insights, 
Souls that have done so much damage and become dissolved can never manifest on earth again or any of the worlds, right? Yes, Cyrus replied. In that case, when the numerous spiritual teachings and prophecies predict the coming of the end of the world for us, how do you interpret this end? Cyrus replied, we do not foresee the end of this beautiful planet or any of the nurturing, life-hosting cosmic bodies in all the universes. Those don't end. They've been there and they will continue to be there, despite you. We see civilizations and consciousnesses ending, but not the life-hosting bodies of the universes. The way we see it, your world today is spiraling with negativity very much along the lines of what the prophecies have predicted. Therefore, the beings in your world that have contributed significantly to this darkness are possibly not going to manifest again anywhere. Because the numbers of such beings today is ever increasing, we may be looking at dissolution occurring at a much larger scale at this point in the cycle of your civilization not of all consciousnesses, but specifically the ones that have become unsustainable. That's how we foresee the end of the world. It is basically the permanent disappearance of the darkest consciousnesses, leaving behind those that are on the path of the light, even if it be at the very early stages. This world will be left with a new civilization of beings that will heal the damage and thrive not only on Earth, but also across the universe. These beings have already been born, he says, and continue to be born. They are very different to their predecessors when it comes to ethics, values, and consciousness. You can see in the young children of today, they are a lot more compassionate and empathetic than your previous generations. So this is how we see the future of humanity. It is self-cleansing and bright, and you can all look ahead with much hope. And this has happened many times in human history. But he says, if you are amongst the ones spiraling in darkness, there is still time to step out of the spiral and get back on the path of the light, the path of the one soul. We can also say that there is so much truth to the references of justice in the scriptures. And we, you interpret justice as you do good, you'll be rewarded. You do bad, you'll be punished. Or someone who keeps doing bad and we say, why don't they ever get punished? But he says there's so much truth to these references on justice. He says in the long run, justice comes through dissolution. When all opportunities for a consciousness to change have been exhausted, because the universe is very nurturing. The one soul is very loving, very caring. You're given lots of opportunities. But if all of them are exhausted, then dissolution occurs. And Cyrus says, it is now time for us to leave you. And I said, we thank you deeply for the insights you have offered us today as excellent food for thought. So my dear friends, that was an interesting set of new knowledge coming our way in this form. I believe we now have a better understanding of the one soul and the individual consciousness. The one soul, where the consciousness draws life from, is our true self. And this is why spiritual teachings from across many cultures say that when you know yourself, you know God. When you know yourself, you know God, because you recognize you are the one soul, which is ever living and ever continuous, which are hallmarks of the creator. So each of us has a true self, which we call the higher self, which is the one soul. And then we have the individual self that largely lives in our minds at a physical plane, which is our individual consciousness. So you've got the higher self, and the individual self. And we can all celebrate today the fact that each one of us has both these dimensions, the higher self, which is our life level, 
and the individual self, which is our consciousness, we are living at both these levels all the time. However, most of us are too consumed with the individual self and we fail to experience the richness of the life level, which we can all live within if we consciously work towards it. How, you may ask? My dear friends, when we meditate, we transcend the individual self or individual consciousness and experience the life level, our higher self, the one soul. And that's what we are always searching for. And at this point, when we do, we are also connecting with the universal consciousness. We all have this capacity. And as we develop it further, we can all live consciously and simultaneously at the level, at the life level and the individual consciousness level. How amazing would our life in this world be if we could consciously live at both these levels all the time? Imagine the serious breadth and depth of awareness we would have in our daily lives. And today I would like to share a meditation technique that we can use as a tool to engage with the life level while consciously living at the individual consciousness level. But before we start our meditation, I would like to go back to what Cyrus said at the beginning about the sacred riddle of life. Now that we have learned something new, what you think is, is not, and what you think is not, is. When you follow this riddle, you find it can be circular, unless of course you use it once for each circumstance to shift your thinking and dig deeper into what is and is not real. So you use it once for each circumstance. Now, having learned what we have about our individual consciousness, which starts its journey in this world as imperfect and evolved towards becoming perfect, through gaining knowledge, experience, and light, we can recognize that a core aspect of this perfection is wisdom, which with each realization of knowledge comes an equal growth in wisdom. With each realization of knowledge comes an equal growth in wisdom. So from childhood to adulthood, to becoming a senior citizen, one thing we are all constantly acquiring is wisdom. So aging and wisdom, they go hand in hand. Unless, of course, you are blessed with a lot of realizations very early on in life. But by and large, as your individual consciousness ages, your wisdom matures, while your body gradually begins to lose some of its capacities. However, I also believe that those of us who focus consciously on acquiring knowledge, wisdom, and light from our experiences, our bodies also remain young, and aging slows down considerably. When our consciousness becomes more illuminated, every cell in our body emanates this light, and thus cellular aging does slow down. Which is why you will find that people that meditate regularly, take time for contemplation, and remain calm, peaceful, and balanced in their life's journey by living both in the higher self and the individual self, they stop aging physically. Their aging slows down completely because the illumination of their cells with such powerful intelligence adds to their, adds to their life and their vigor, thus keeping the cells all buoyant. So equipped with this understanding, let us look at the sacred riddle. What you think is, is not, and what you think is not, is. The key word here is think, because the process of thinking is of the mind that resides in the individual consciousness, which is imperfect. So what you think is, as perceived by your mind, the riddle says is not. And what you think is not, as perceived by your mind, the riddle says is. So the word think is the key here. Now, when you apply your ever-growing wisdom from the higher self and individual self to what you think, 
what happens? You no longer think. You know because your power of recognition of what is real and what is illusion is now much stronger. You have gained clarity through your wisdom, so you know. So the word think disappears and gets replaced by the word know. And so the sacred riddle begins to get solved gradually. And it ends up as what you know is and what you know is not, is not. This is the statement of sacred reality. So through your life's journey, the sacred riddle gradually unfolds into the sacred reality. And that is what the origin was indicating to all creation that was going to manifest in this world. So my dear friends, the whole journey of our individual self in this world of endless illusions is a process that elevates us from think to know through our acquired wisdom and the use of an enlightened mind that is constantly engaged with the higher self. At this stage, the conscious individual mind is now bridged through the intellect with the higher self. And that's where we all seek to end up if we are so blessed. When Cyrus shared this riddle as a key reflection at our crossroads, he wanted us to realize where we are now and where our journey will take us as we gain knowledge, wisdom, and light by transitioning from thinking to knowing. So my dear friends, do reflect on the sacred riddle in your daily individual journey and realize your growth in knowledge and wisdom as you begin to live consciously in your higher and individual self. So today's understanding of the soul and consciousness has given us much to consider, contemplate, and adopt what works for us and not what doesn't. Now let us practice this short meditation of reaching and, li and living at the life level. And it's a technique you can then use in your daily life and as you perfect it, you'll be able to get from point A to point B with a simple thought. So take a moment, sit back, and be completely relaxed. Close your eyes and breathe freely. Let go of all your stresses, worries, tensions, let them all leave your body and breathe in and take in peace, pure peace. Take a moment to be at complete peace. And I would like you to imagine you are in a beautiful garden with rich green grass. The garden has many flower beds and trees. The sky is blue and the morning sun is shining. The morning air is fresh and cool. And there is a small beautiful river with crystal clear water flowing through this garden. Its water is sparkling in the morning sun. Take a moment and connect with this beautiful guide garden and its rich vibrance of nature. So you are in this beautiful garden with the green grass, the flower beds, the trees, the crystal clear water flowing in the river, the blue sky, the fresh morning air. And now you see a stone bench right next to the river. So you go over 
and you sit down on this bench right next to the river. Your feet rest on the cool river rocks. Feel their coolness. You watch the crystal clear, fast flowing water forming ripples over the rocks. It is flowing with life, energy and purity and you are right next to it. Take a moment and look at this river. Feel its flow, feel its energy. And then you look at the rest of the garden while sitting on the bench and you marvel at the rich green grass. It's luscious and green. You look in front of you, there is a tall tree very near to you and you start focusing on this tree. This tree is on the other side of the river and you start focusing on this tree. So take a moment and focus on this beautiful tree standing right next to the river. And feel its life flowing through it. And feel its life flowing through it and then flowing to you and through you. So the life of the tree is flowing all to every cell of the tree. And this very life is flowing to you and reaching every element of your being. You and the tree are one. You then look at the flower beds. Look at their colors, look at their beauty. And then feel their life flowing through them, through each flower. Feel the life flowing through each flower. And then this life is flowing to you and through you back to the flower bed. You and the flower bed are one. You and the whole garden are one. You are one life. Everything in the garden has life. All of it is flowing through you and from you back right through the garden. You and the garden are one life. And this brings you so much happiness and peace. Being one life with all the creation around you. Then above you appears a luminous cloud glowing with a soft, gentle light. It's a thin cloud glowing with a soft, gentle light. It is quite close to you, just above the trees. And you see the life of the trees and the life of the flower beds and the life of the green grass flowing up into this luminous cloud and they become one with the cloud. You feel your life energy flow from your feet on the cool river rocks you feel your life energy 
flow up your legs. Then it flows up to your waist. And then from your waist up to your heart. And then all the way up to the center of your forehead, where you see a golden cord that connects the center of your forehead with the luminous cloud above. You feel yourself flow with your life energy up into this luminous cloud. You are now one with the cloud. All you can see is the soft, gentle, loving light of life flowing into every element of your being. You are now the luminous cloud. You are in the one soul, your higher self. You are ever living. You are eternal. You are continuous, ever continuous. And you can never die because you have no beginning and no end. You are in the life level. You are pure life, the life of everything. And in the presence of this light, you repeat, I am life. I am life. I am life. Keep repeating these few wo these words for a few moments. I am life. I am life. I am ever living. I am ever living. I am ever living. Ever living. Ever living. Ever living. Ever living. Ever living. Living. Keep repeating this word for a few moments. Ever living. I am ever living. And in the presence of the light of life, you repeat, I am eternal. I am eternal. I am eternal. Eternal. Eternal, eternal. Keep repeating this word for a few moments. Eternal.
eternal. Your higher self and individual self are now one at the life level and you are in the light of the one soul. And as you look down from the cloud below you, you see the garden. You see people. You see life humming away. Life that you experience through your individual self all the time. You're looking down at it from the luminous cloud. And now you are life itself. And you are also the individual self. Life flows from you down to everything in the garden. And life flows up to you from everything in the garden. You are in the flow of life. Take a few moments to internalize this flow of life. You are the flow of life. And then in the presence of the light of the one soul, we offer gratitude. Gratitude for this connection. Gratitude for this blessing. Gratitude. 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 Keep repeating this word for a few moments. Gratitude. And filled with gratitude, you then flow down with your life force and your individual self back into the garden. You are back in the garden where your individual self journeys. You look above you and you see the luminous cloud which is your life level. You are there too. Take a moment and look at this cloud, your life level, and flow up into it through the golden cord from the center of your forehead. And when you get into it, be in its light for a couple of moments. Pure light, light of life. And then you flow back down from the luminous cloud back into the garden. Take a few moments and do this a few times. Flow up to the level of life. Draw upon its light, draw upon its peace, and then flow back down into the garden with your individual self. Take a moment and practice this a couple of times.
you are now able to go with your individual self to your life level. Draw everything from it and flow back down. Take one more look at your life level, the cloud above you. It is always there and always with you, and you are always in it. Even as you journey with your individual self and experience life through it, the life level is always with you. You may open your eyes. My dear friends, practice this meditation as often as you can, even through your day. When you are bombarded with challenges, go into the life level and stay there. Take in its light, power, wisdom, and clarity, and then continue with working your way through your challenges. You will find much peace in every second you can get within your life level. Visit this level as frequently as you can and live in it while striving in your individual conscious journey below. As you practice this meditation frequently, you will be able to switch into the life level easily with a single thought, but it requires some practice. So with that, I'd like to conclude today's webinar and I'd like to thank each one of you for being present, for bringing your light, bringing your energy, your positivity and your blessing to this meditation and this event and I pray that the light of our Creator may always be with you to help you, guide you, protect you and love you always. Stay happy and blessed.